So after I auditioned, I said, well, Keith, what do you think? And in his dry one sense, he said to me, uh, well, Ken, you're, you're a jailhouse singer. And I thought, Paul and Barnabas in jail singing praises to God? I like that. Is that what you meant? He goes, no, what I mean is you're always behind a few bars and looking for the key. <laughs> That's why you didn't see me up here praising the Lord today. <laughs> well, it's always good to be back here. I don't know if any of you knew my mom, Jean. Yeah. You still live here? She passed away. Do you know that? Yeah. Uh, September 2nd. Oh, wow. And for the last three years, she, I'd ask her, how do I pray for you, Mom? And she'd say, well, pray that the Lord would take me home. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mom, you realize you're asking me to pray that you'll die. And she goes, yes. <laughs> okay. But when she passed, I was heartbroken, but not a whole lot, because I know where she is. And I know I'll see her again. And even as much as I want her back, I can guarantee you that she don't want to come back. <laughs> Brother, we're all in a battle. You, you, you do realize that, right? We are in a battle, in a spiritual battle. The Lord didn't give us a perception of the spiritual world, but it affects everything that we do. We're in a battle. If you don't believe in the battle, you better change your mind because you're in one. And Satan collects all his little demons and he says, okay guys, get your sticks. We're gonna go beat up the Christians. And then Jesus appears with his atomic bomb. No match. Thank God we have Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, your word, the talent you gave me, the skills you gave me, allow me to decrease, Lord, and just let our spirits drink in your word because we know the truths of your word are spiritually discerned we love you for that lord bless all my friends here in jesus name amen, amen. before i start i'd like to do just one little thing uh keith let's go with this thing <laughs> If anyone teaches false doctrine or does not agree to the sound instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ, nor to godly teachings, he's conceited. He understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels over word that lead men into envy and strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between men of corrupt minds who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. But we know that godliness with contentment is a great gain for brethren. We brought nothing into this world. We'll take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, let us be content with that. Some people wanting to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many harmful and disastrous things that lead men into uh, envy and strife. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But you, brethren of God, flee from all of that and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance. Fight the good fight. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in front of many witnesses. For in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ, who made the good confession while testifying before Pontius Pilate, I charge you this. Keep these commands without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, which God will bring about in his own time. And God, the blessed and only ruler, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is lone is immortal, who lives an unapproachable life, who no man has seen nor can see. To him be glory.
forever and ever. Amen. You want to fight that battle you're in? Follow Jesus' feet. Because there is nothing more that we can do. Just follow Jesus. From the NIV, copyright 1973, the book of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are scattered among the nations, greetings. Now consider it pure joy, my friends, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now perseverance must finish its work so that you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and have no doubt. For the one who doubts is like a, a, a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Such a man should not think he'll receive anything from God. He's a double-minded man and unstable in all that he does. Let the brother in humble, humble circumstances take pride in his high position, but the rich man in his humiliation. For like the wildflower, he will merely fade away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, the plant withers, its blossom falls, and the beauty it once knew is lost forever. In this same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And we're being tempted. No one should say, I am being tempted by God. For God is untouched by evil. He himself tempts no one. But each one of us are tempted when by our own evil desires we are dragged away and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. He does not change like shifting shadows. Brethren, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a, a kind of first fruit of all that he created. And now, dear friends, note this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life which God desires. Therefore, put away all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And how many accept the word that was planted in you? The word which can save you. But do not merely listen to the word and then deceive yourself. No. Do what it says. Anyone who hears the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. After looking at himself, he turns and goes away and forgets what he, well, immediately forgets what he looked like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it also, he will be blessed in everything that he does. Now, brethren, if anyone considers himself religious, but doesn't keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself. His religion, worthless. For religion that our Father finds as pure and faultless as this, to come to the aid of widows and orphans in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. As fellow believers in our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, oh my brethren, don't show favoritism Supposing a man should come into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, well, if you say to the rich man, Sir, here's a fine seat for you right next to me. But you say to the poor man, You may stand over there by the wall, sit on the floor at my feet, I care not. Have you not discriminated amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? 
Dear brethren, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Is it not the rich who are dragging you off to court? And is it not the rich who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? But if you do look in the royal law and scripture which says, love your neighbor as yourself, you do right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For my brethren, you may keep the whole law, stumbling one small point, you're guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, thou shalt not commit adultery, also said, thou shalt not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you are still a lawbreaker. Speak and act like those who will be judged by the perfect law that gives freedom for judgment without mercy will be given to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now what good is it, my friends, if someone claims to have faith but has no deed, can such a faith save him? Supposing a, a brother or a sister is without clothing or daily food and you should say to them, ah, go, I wish you well. Now you keep warm and well fed but you do nothing about his physical needs, what good is that? So you see, faith by itself is useless if not accompanied by deeds. But someone will say, look, you have faith, I have deeds. <laughs> show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith by what I do. You claim that there is one God, and that is to your credit. But even the demons believe that, and they're trembling. Foolish man, do you need more evidence that faith without deeds is dead? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his deeds were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And he was called God's friend. So you see, Faith by itself is not accompanied by deeds. It's dead. Rahab, a prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Not many of us should presume to be teachers, my brother. For you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly, and we all stumble in many ways. If a man has never fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to control his own, own body. Look, when we put horse, uh, bits into the horse's mouth to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or, or take ships as an example. Though they are very large and they're driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wishes them to go. And the tongue is a very small part of the body, but it makes such great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by the smallest spark. And the tongue itself is a fire, a world of evil among its parts. It corrupts the whole person and sets the course of his life on fire and in itself is set on fire by hell. Look, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea have been tamed and are being tamed by men. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With this tongue, we sing praises to our Lord and Father, and with that same tongue, we curse men who are made in his own likeness. Out of the same mouth, proceed blessings and cursings. My brothers, this should not be. Can both salt water and fresh water proceed from the same well? Can a fig tree bear olives? Can a grapevine bear figs? Well, neither can the salt spring produce fresh water. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But brethren, if you are hiding bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it nor deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have vain conceit and selfish ambition, there you have disorder and every kind of evil practice. But the wisdom that comes down from above is first of all pure, then peace-loving, submissive, full of good mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Now, brethren, look, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Is it not your own desires that battle within you? Oh, you want something, but you cannot get it. So you kill and you covet, but you still do not have. So you fight and you quarrel, but brethren, you do not have because you do not ask of God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend what you get on your evil pleasures, you adulterous people. Do you not realize friendship with this world is enmity to God? Make yourself a friend of this world and you have chosen to make God your personal enemy. Ooh. Or do you think the scripture says without notice, he jealously desires the spirit that he made to dwell within us, but God gives us more grace. And that is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. He's a punk. He'll flee from you. Draw near to your God, and your God will draw near to you. Wash your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. We wail and mourn. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself before your God and He will lift you up. Now, do not slander one another. For anyone who speaks against his brother and judges him speaks against the law and judges it. Now, if you are sitting in judgment on the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. Brethren, there's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is both able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen to me. You who say, oh, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year conducting business, turn a profit. <laughs> You are not even, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What are you, man, but a, a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord is willing, we will do this or that. As it is, you're boasting and you're bragging, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, my brethren, the one who knows the good he ought to do and does not do it sins. Now listen to me, you rich man. Weep and wail for the misery that is about to befall you. Your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver have tarnished. And that tarnish will testify against you and eat your flesh like wild fire. <laughs> The wages you failed to pay your workmen who mowed your field are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord God Almighty. You have fattened yourself living in luxury and self-indulgence for the day of slaughter. And the day of slaughter is upon you. You have condemned and murdered the innocent man that was not opposing you. Therefore, be patient, my brethren, because the Lord is coming. See how the farmer waits for the autumn and the spring rains, and how can be patient because
because the Lord's coming is near. Do not judge one another, or you will be judged. Look, your judge is standing at the door, silently watching you. Now, as an example of perseverance in the face of trial, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Do you know that we consider anyone blessed who has persevered? And you have heard about Job and what the Lord finally brought about in his life. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. But note this, brothers. Do not swear. Not by heaven, not by earth, not by anything. Just simply let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. Is any one of you in trouble? Oh, pray. Is any of you happy? Sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the church elders together to anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith will make this sick person well. The Lord will lift him up. Therefore, brethren, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed because the fervent prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like you and I. He prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. He prayed again and the heavens gave forth their rain and the land produced its valuable crops. Now take note of this. If anyone among you should wander from the truth and another should bring him back, note this, anyone who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. Amen. How is it, this is me talking now, how is it that God's word, which I absolutely believe to be the unadulterated word of our Lord and our God. There's no mistakes in it. There's no contradictions. For 4,000 years, since the first time it was ever talked about, kings and rulers and armies and crazy people have done everything they can to destroy it. And do you know, in that 4,000 years, not one word has been disproven. And in that same 4,000 years, many of it, much of it has been proven to go along with science, or should I say science, to go along with it. So God's word tells us, you're saved by grace through faith. And that faith isn't even of yourselves. It's a gift from God, it's not by works. Lest any man should boast. James is not saying, you're saved by works. What he's saying is, if you are saved, truly saved, how could you see injustice? How could you see someone hurting? How could you see a child hurting and not be filled with compassion for that person? If you do that, if you can look on those things and not feel compassion and mercy for someone like that, are you really saved? Were you ever really saved? Because I know when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was done with foolishness. Don't laugh. <laughs> Some people might know me to joke around a little bit. So I'm wondering, if I'm saved by grace through faith, solo Christus, by Christ alone, if, I, if that's why I am saved, how can I go to my brother who has wandered from the truth, <clears throat> tell him the error of his way, save him from death? Me? I had a big dilemma about this when I was memorizing this book. I can't save anybody. Fill in the words. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Finally, after many weeks of turmoil in my head, trying to figure out what this word was trying to tell me, 
the Holy Spirit finally broke through and said, you can save them from death. Only Jesus can save them to life. I can save them from death because it covers a multitude of sin. What is it that covers a multitude of sins? It's love. If I love my brother so much that I am willing to bring it to his attention the things that he is doing that are not godly or that he's wandered from the truth, don't I take the chance of severing that relationship? That relationship will die. Or he'll come back later and say, you were right, thank you, I love you. But brethren, we're in the battle. We are in this battle. Satan comes with his little sticks. Jesus comes with his atomic bomb. And it says that in scripture. Who he will destroy with the brightness of his coming. His coming, brethren. I know you feel it. Everybody I talk to, everywhere in the country, when I speak the word, they all agree we are running out of time. And you can make that sure in the words by John in 1 John. My dear children, this is the last hour. That was 2,000 years ago. If 2,000 years ago was the last hour, where are we on the clock? We're seconds away from it. Believe in him with all your heart and know that he is the answer to every problem. I'd like to take this book and I'd like to say, do you have a problem here? You, you have a problem with that here? Because that book is God's word. And I am just grateful to God that so long ago, he pulled me out of my addiction to methamphetamine, set my feet on the solid ground, and told me, memorize scripture. And now 22 books memorized. And so if you're going to applaud, applaud to him, he's the one to do it. Thank you, Lord. And that's all I have to say about that. Fred, you're up. <laughs>
is one that I sang in Sunday school years ago, and since we were doing some others that we sing in Sunday school a lot, I thought we might do this. This really speaks to what the Bible does for us. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness, and all we have to do is follow Him. Where do we get the instruction about the way? In the Bible. Amen? Okay, let's sing The Lord Knows the Way Through the Book.